<laughs> All right, next up is uh, Jamie Fidel, and Jamie is the General Counsel and Forest and Wildlife Program Director for the Vermont Natural Resource Council, BNRC, and in this capacity, Jamie shares legal advocacy, he oversees forest and wildlife programs and research, works on environmental policy at the Vermont State House, and convenes the Forest Roundtable, which brings diverse stakeholders together to address forest policy, management, and conservation issues throughout Vermont. Great partners, and please to welcome Jamie. My title, now you get the policy walk, following up with uh, all the, the energy and excitement of the, the previous two presentations. I'm going to step back for a second and not so much focus on the message, but the process that goes into effective communications, getting science into, um, to move into policy. And so um, I'm just going to go with this kind of broad theme or outline of, of the process here. So you have your science, obviously, that's what's kind of a bedrock. Um, it's published science, it's peer-reviewed science. Then there's an awareness building stage, um, and that may be led by an agency or a non-NGO, uh, academic um, uh, institution. Um, and then there's a defining catalyst somewhere along the way, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, there's kind of the necessary advocacy that, that goes with it. Uh, the science itself will only go so far. Um, and then finally you will have the science integrated into the policy. So a couple of quick um, examples here of where I've seen some really effective communications through a process leading from sound science into actually uh, statewide policy. Okay, so example number one, flood erosion regulations. You have the science, you have the rivers program at the A&R, I'm sure working with, with scientists at UVM and elsewhere to develop the science of fluvial geomorphology. The awareness building, the program hammers away and demonstrates to regional and local planners and policymakers that we need to recognize that river corridors will move and we have to make decisions about where we develop and build infrastructure based on these results. The advocacy, okay, there's statewide advocacy, they're plugging into multiple outlets and venues, continuing with the messaging um, and actually, actually getting some results. Local and regional planning commissions are a number of towns adopting flood and erosion hazard regulations. Then you have a defining catalyst. There's, a, there's, this, there's this moment, you have Hurricane Irene, and it kind of, it really starts to solidify the understanding of why this is all important. And then ultimately the state regulations on river corridors and erosion hazard areas. So this is one example of a very effective development of the policy, consistent communications leading to policy initiatives, um, and putting the catalyst event into perspective and then moving it through. Okay, so Bridget said not to use fragmentation as a word, although I'm, I'm going to. Um, and, um, and, and we can debate whether that's the right, the right word or not, but as far as the process goes, so we've got lots of science on forest fragmentation that's been developed in the state, regionally, nationally, worldwide. Okay, and it shows the effects of, of fragmentation, ecological effects and economic effects. Um, the Agency of Natural Resources at the same time is starting to def define where are these large forest blocks um, in the state. Um, at VNRC, we, we're doing the research on the land use trends that are affecting <laughs> and ultimately creating fragmentation. But you have this huge awareness building um, uh, process, and that's, um, and, and this isn't the only one, but through a decade of discussion and coalition building and sharing of information at a statewide forest roundtable, begin to develop a report with the communication points, the strategies in that report and what fragmentation means. And then you kind of have this catalyst opportunity where um, the legislature calls on the Agency of Natural Resources to write a report. And in my mind, this was a seminal report. This was a report that had credibility, it synthesized the science, it outlined to the legislature the strategies, it was well presented in the legislature, very effective communication from uh, Commissioner Snyder outlining what fragmentation meant to our state, to our rural working lands, and our e ecology. Um, but you also had testimony from scientists along the way. You had lobbying, you had coalition building, you had grassroots support. 
And there was an entire process that went into finally the legislature actually adopting in 2016 a forest omnibus bill that actually now requires statewide municipalities and regional planning commissions to actually plan to minimize forest fragmentation and to maintain forest blocks and habitat connectors. And now another piece of legislation which they're considering now in regards to the statewide development review process. And so just some quick reflections on, on this, this process that, you know, we all I think intuitively know this, that science really should provide a foundation for policy, but does it always? Um, scientists should partake in the awareness to build the credibility and the technical expertise that's needed and not to be afraid to actually partake in advocacy by sharing the message of what they see in the science. This helps to build the credibility of the policy action. In the case of legislative policy, and, and we know that science and advocacy are both essential, along with grassroots support and building a coalition and a consistent drumbeat. Well, we know that science can be used both to speed up and slow down policy, right? It's easy to poke holes in the science and say we shouldn't move forward, but you have to seize on a catalyst um, event or an opportunity and begin to push through what you think is a powerful end result. Um, and, um, and finally, find or create venues to share information and develop effective communications and to shape policy, and that's the plug in every step along the way. And I too agree with Bridget. In the beginning, we were like, forest fragmentation, this is not the right way to be talking about this. But after, I'd say, a decade of it being out there through a lot of COVID, coalition building and communications, the science at the agency, the polling that I've seen recently shows that actually the public is responding. They understand what fragmentation is, and they're actually saying that it's, it's a concern. And that was shocking to me, but as I look back, you know, through this consistent process, the consistent drumbeat in the advocacy and the science and, and putting that out to the public, that it can actually turn what you think is a wonky term into one that the public actually accepts. Whether that's still the right term for us to be using is one we can debate, but um, hopefully this was an example of where you have effective communications leading up to good policy.